in any score. So what's the point even doing it then if the outcome's already agreed? <coughs> okay, yep. So if you know the outcome, uh, what's the point doing it? Or what's the point taking part? Or we're going to watch it. Okay, we're going to watch it. Yep. Okay. So yep, it's, there's a kind of sense of challenge to the kind of integrity of a score. So if we if we've got if you've got match fixing, then it kind of seems to fairly logically undermine the, the very thing that we're, we're, we're interested in. So the no notion of it is that it's going to ruin or it's going to challenge the integrity of the sport. And I think that's absolutely the case. And it's the integrity of the sport in terms of um, those who are participating in sport, and I think it should probably link into what you were talking about a second or two, if I can't trust you because I know you're on drugs, then the integrity of the sport is in some way damaged. And if I don't actually believe that everyone has taken part in the sport, um, in an honest and a transparent and a fair way, then I maybe don't think it's actually worth doing. And if I'm a spectator, I probably don't think it's necessarily worth watching if I don't actually believe what I'm seeing the genuine kind of context. So that's broadly speaking, I think, what, um, uh, why, why it matters. Um, some people, um, and Paul might have disagreed or he might have agreed, that um, would claim that actually it's the greatest threat to the integrity of sport. So you jump down to uh, the core at the bottom from the former um, IOC president, uh, Jacques Roche. The doping affects one individual athlete, although I think that's slightly debatable, but the impact of match fixing affects the whole competition. It's much bigger. So what he's kind of asserting is that because this actually fundamentally challenges the integrity, whereas doping, if you're being kind, you might say, well, it affects the doping athlete. Um, but of course, it's probably a bit more than that because you know if you win uh, a competition while having doped, then you came second and now lost because that person was really doping. So I think it's a little bit more than that. But I think it at least gets that sense of here's another big problem that sport potentially has, and people at the very top of sport actually are considering this to be one of the most fundamental challenges that sport faces. And you can think about it, you know, in slightly more kind of you know, I suppose kind of technical language. Um, if we think what sport actually is. It's that contest between individuals or teams um, who, as we're kind of saying there, agree to play by the same rules. There's, there's, there's defined rules in the game. And if you think about it in terms of the kind of the market aspect of sport or, or, or the, the sport that appeals to kind of wider publication, it's that thing that um, you'd have picked up when, we, when Nicholas had you about know, uncertainty of outcome. But we kind of like watching sport because we don't know what's going to happen. That might be the kind of more complicated versions of uncertainty of outcome you can look at in league competitions, but it's also that kind of more simplistic idea, as you exactly said, you go along to watch a sport event, you kind of think it'd be nice to know, not to know what's going to happen in that event, and that you've got this kind of fairness of competition. So it seems you know, pretty straightforward that it's a fundamental um, part of, of sports uh, attraction, and, it's, and it's, it's inherent integrity. And if the results, or indeed some part of the, the results or some part of the event is predetermined, you're going to lose that integrity and potentially, think about it from a kind of business point of view, um, you're going to lose some of the, the market potential that that sport has. So if you keep chipping away and undermining the kind of believability of the sport, similar again to, to doping, maybe people not believe in it, then you might expect to see some challenges to the value or the attractiveness of that product in those terms to different organisations that, that exist in the market. So str quite strong links there, it's about a different form of corruption, it's the same kind of thing. Um, I want this to be believable and I want you to believe in it because you want to take part, but I also want to sell it on the basis that you're playing a genuine golf match, tennis match, snooker match, whatever it might be, not that somebody somewhere has already had some influence over the, uh, over the event. So that one's quite, I think, quite straightforward. And <coughs> um, the next one's quite straightforward regrettably, regrettably as well. Uh, where does match fixing take place? So, give me some, give me some sense of where you think uh, examples of, of match fixing. Yep. Um, so, one example is quite a while back now. It happened in Germany in the Bundesliga. Well, like a cup. There was a referee who called Robert Poitzer. Yep. Um, who had deliberately um, yeah, fixed games that sort of, you know, gave penalties that were clearly not penalties for underdog teams to win, and he then put a bet on. Yeah. Um, so that would be my example. I think. I've 
absolutely, really, really good example. Uh, uh, the re German referee was 2006, I think, um, who um, was a football referee in this case, but he was wrapped up in a kind of bigger web or network of um, illegal practices, illegal operations. But his job was to basically to to make decisions in the match, which were therefore likely to alter the outcome of that match. And if you think about the kind of general idea between behind match fixing in, in different sports. There are certain people who are obviously going to be in a better position than others, you think, to alter the outcome of an event. And if you've got a team sport, um, perhaps one of the crucial people involved, um, and it also reduces the number of people who have to be involved, it's the person in the middle, the referee. So if the referee is able to award dubious penalties or chop off goals or whatever it might be, um, that's one person you can get at, which is maybe going to be simpler than getting at um, a whole team um, or enough players who are actually signed up to the idea. So that was a very high profile example. I think it was top division in, in German football. And what came out in the court case was the kind of links into a much wider network, as you say, of, of illegality, corruption. This was, he was just coming and says the public face of it, but was punished for that. So a good example, given that it was the kind of referee part of it. Any other examples? Uh, recently, well, there's been a lot of sort of tennis matches where yep. higher ranked players are losing to like people are like much lower ranked and, and there's been like suspicious betting patterns around the sort of particular losses. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I think it really again really is unfair. I mean, the whole the whole tennis thing um, is one where it's been particularly prominent in, in recent years. Um, and there's often a kind of suggestion that individual sports are easier to match fix or to corrupt because again there are fewer people involved. So you've got less fewer people to engage with in order to try to transform the outcome of the event. So tennis is, is perceived to have quite, or certainly has been perceived to have quite a significant problem, um, and it usually uh, manifests itself in that kind of thing, strange results. And of course, sport does have strange results, you know, we, we all get that, but it's the kind of pattern of peculiarity, of the pattern of strangeness that causes people to look into it in a bit more detail. Um, and um, I'm trying to think, it was, I think it was David Yanko a number of years ago, who was a very prominent tennis player, was certainly accused of match fixing. I think eventually the charges were dropped or in the Scottish term not proven. Um, I don't think he actually was found guilty of anything, but that's a second a second issue about how you then prove these things because that's quite challenging as well. But I think tennis is a really interesting example because it comes up quite frequently in tennis um, and it is probably that sense of the relative ease of intervening. So football referee, tennis players, any other other ones you can Okay, yep. Um, Years ago, they like, something to do with the referees or something at bottom or paid off teams or something, I think. Yep. I can't remember exactly, but I know they got them for something. Yep. Uh, our, our, so, yep. Because it, it wasn't only Juventus, was it? No. So I think it was quite a few teams, and they had things like they had uh, the president of Juventus would have like the phone number of several of the referees, and they're like got burner phones and calling them up, and yep. then you got set, like, several of the teams got treated differently on how they like. Uh, some got relegated, some got points taken away. So. Absolutely, yeah, there was a, a very famous scandal, which I'm sure you'll remember well, uh, Calciopoli, um, in 2006, which, as you see, Juventus were perhaps the most prominent fall guy in terms of the organisation, one of the most prominent Italian football clubs, uh, was relegated uh, to, I think it was Serie A, League, yeah, and, uh, but a number of other clubs were implicated, the referee, there was, again, that way, what you begin to see is the kind of web of corruption that surrounds these things, that there are a number of organisations and agencies involved at different levels. Um, and I guess bits of, <laughs> bits of Italian sporting history and about Italian sporting and culture, for want of a better word, sometimes going to lend themselves to, to that kind of uh, behaviour, um, which, and that was a kind of extreme example, where you've got the most prominent sporting organisations probably in that country implicated in fixing matches, uh, buying referees, influencing outcomes, and so the punishments not for Juventus, it was from Milan as well, I think, and uh, a couple of other major teams too. So really significant one. And I think there was one before that in Italy, it was a Totonero, I think in 1980, similar thing involving um, Paolo Rossi, I think was involved in that one of the most prom prominent Italian football players at that time, you know, extremely high profile sports person, um, was also caught up in that. And therefore a very wealthy person, which is something like come back to later on too, very somebody who had done very well at sport, but was still caught up in this kind of a scandal. So football's got plenty of examples. These are really good ones that the referee and Calciopoli. Any, any other sports you, you've come across tennis we've had? Any other ones you come across? There was a rumour in cycling that a 
think it was the 2012 Olympics that um, one of the riders had paid another one to sort of come second. It's pedal, pedal slower. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, right. I wasn't actually aware of that one, but I'm sure, I'm sure that's probably probably the case because you can influence it different different <coughs> ways. Um, Snooker. Snooker. Yep. No, I just think it's sort of like um, lots of you know, a few instances where John Higgins obviously was caught in a sting process. He claimed that obviously he was in a pressured situation. And he wouldn't have done it, but certainly there's been a case of. I think some Asian players that have uh, lost just particular frames, not lose the match, but being told to lose a certain frame. You know, yeah, groups could bet on them. And that's, 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 that's a really, again, a really good example. Um, snooker, it brings us back to our friends in gambling. Uh, snooker's got a very kind of um, big relationship with gambling. Um, the first example you mentioned there of uh, John Higgins, the former world champion. We're not talking about somebody trying to find their way in a particular sport. Um, who's perhaps in you know, need of extra extra funds, but caught on a sting. Um, and by that, what I mean by that is he was kind of set up um, by newspapers who presented him with um, a situation where he felt pressurised into saying he would organise the outcomes of certain as a certain match or certain frames. Um, but his was one of his defences was that um, he didn't set out to be a match fixer, but he was put in a situation where threats were made, if I recall, about his family or threats about it, his private life. I can't quite remember the details, but there were reasons where he thought, I'm going to do this because actually doing it is a less bad outcome than what might be the case if these threats are carried through. And it was related to, I think, um, uh, criminal, 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 criminality or a fairly substantial scale in, in um, various kind of Far Eastern countries at that time. So that was an interesting example. I think you also make a really good point there about something here that it was in my kind of bracket there. You out alter the outcome of an event, so you alter who wins a tennis match, or you can do what they call kind of sport fixing. And sport fixing is where you alter some bit of the game, but it doesn't alter the event or the tournament, but it doesn't necessarily alter the outcome. So throwing a particular um, free um, that would be an example of sport fixing. It might still be the same person who ends up winning the event overall, but if I uh, agree to throw a particular frame and I pass that information to the relevant parties, those relevant parties then take advantage of that and say, I'm expecting, um, and even though this is by far the best player playing against the weaker player, frame seven he's not going to be playing, or he or she's not going to play very well in frame seven, I'm going to bet on the opponent and then the bit of legal betting activity comes in on that frame, and sure enough, lo and behold, you don't pop quite as well in frame seven, and then the match returns to its normal process. So spot fixing is when you're looking at a specific aspect, and um, cricket, uh, we haven't mentioned cricket, maybe I've got a few of our, 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 our Indian um, students are not here today, I'm sure we could have had plenty of examples in cricket, so my goodness, we have corruption and plenty in the world of, of cricket as well, not just the overall uh, Games, but things like the number of no balls, people people bowl, bowling no balls, so the ball the ball doesn't the ball doesn't count, the ball doesn't count, and that's something that obviously has a material effect on the way in which cricket is played. But there's a particular thing that people are looking out for. So you're actually saying we'll bet on the number of no balls in a particular over or over a particular period of time. So you're not throwing the match, and therefore to some of those involved, it perhaps feels less serious. So I might not want to throw the match if I'm representing my country or I'm representing my IPL team, because that sounds really damaging integrity of sport. But what happens if I just bowl rather inappropriately for a few shots, a few balls? And so I'm not going to change the game, but I'll do quite well out of it and it'll help me reward myself. But the integrity is still kind of there because it's not a couple of no balls here and there, a frame here and there. Does it really alter the integrity of the sport or is it just a little bit um, softer? You know, and that's, that's the kind of argument, not necessarily my argument. I'm really presenting that some of the arguments you might find around that. Yeah. Uh, this is a similar example in Greece, like last year. Yeah. Uh, football player, because they didn't get paid enough, they started to bet on corners and cuts in order to make their living. Yeah. So that's I think that's an excellent example again where you've got quite different to some of the, like, the kind of higher profile people who've got caught up in this who appear to be at the top of their sport and are still attracted by it. And you've got kind of any particular economic circumstances around Greek players, there's no money coming into the game, you're not being paid for it, um, and therefore it's a kind of needs must situation. Well, you're not going to pay me, then I've got to find some other way of making a, a, a reward. I'm still damaging the integrity of the sport but I've got a kind of greater motivation or a more justifiable motivation than perhaps some of the other ones. Yes, that's a really good example. Yep. And I think even Formula One, uh, 
I know there's been <coughs> a few instances where the teammate who has been told of uh, uh, a driver who was going for a win uh, was uh, told to crash into someone who was uh, in um, pursuit of that driver. I think it was 2008. Okay. And also there yep. was this whole thing about Ayrton Senna uh, crashing um, in the first uh, turn. I think it was 91. Just so we can win the, the championship, right? Yep. Yep. So that too, it could be like within the the, the team. Yeah, it could be, yeah. I think and think what begins to emerge here is it can be anywhere, and it can be any sport. And actually, if you stop and think about it, it's remarkably easy if you've got the willingness to do it to think come up with ways where you can actually damage the integrity of the sport. Because probably as we were finishing off saying in the last session. It relies on a bit of common sense and a bit of goodwill. We know why we're there and we're there for treating this as a fair and open competition. And the moment you don't have that principle attached to it, then actually it's not very, very difficult. Um, whether it's the mundane thing of throw-ins. In football, there's a thing around throw-ins. There used to be people would spot bet on when throw-ins would happen. And uh, one of the former England football players, Matt Letizia, um, was eventually came out about this because he had taken money. Uh, and, and his money was to make sure the ball went out for a throw at a certain minute of the game. So sure enough, he gets the ball, he's a very talented football player, um, he, knocks the, he hits the ball out for a throw in, one of his teammates comes flying across, keeps the ball in play. You know, and suddenly the whole bet collapses in the most ludicrous fashion because a world-class player has hit an appalling pass, and yet some <laughs> other person comes careering across to keep it in, and that was part of the reason why the thing came out, because then, um, the, of course, the, the corrupt individuals didn't make the money on that particular thing, and it all began came out. So. I'm just thinking about that very strange example uh, that happened last year in the FA Cup game. Uh, I Bobby Arson <laughs> with the <laughs> guy eating yes. yeah. <laughs> It's not just football related, or it's not just sport related, but anything that... Yeah, and it brings you back. That was a situation, those who didn't see, there was a, a non-league football team who uh, they drew, was it? Play against was it Manchester United? Arsenal. 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 Yeah, playing against Arsenal is one of the bigger teams uh, in, in the UK. It was a very small game, a lot, a lot of attention on it because a tiny little club playing the bigger team. They had a very um, not ample or large coach, <laughs> you might say, um, who was their coach, but was, was brought onto the bench. With, and um, you know, he was a very, very big individual, did not look much like a, a sports person, if we're being honest about it. And at some point during the game, he, um, he started eating a pie and it just happened to be live on TV, and there was a betting conspiracy around that betting. Uh, and so you're right, so again, there was clearly a setup there, but people were, because he, he recognised that was how he trained, he ate lots of pies, but just by chance he happened to eat one in front of the TV camera, and of course people were making money of it. So you're right, it can be directly sport related, or it can be kind of peripheral to sport. Um, I mean, there's, there's tons and tons of many we've covered here. I mean, that, and that, believe me, is, is but a tiny, tiny fraction had I had the rest of the, the month to come up that I can still be writing things. But, you know, from cricket, I say, um, is, is, it's many, many examples, including some of the top uh, players in the world, like the former South African captain, Hansi Kronia, who was guilty or was found guilty of match, uh, match fixing. You've got it in the, the Pakistani national team, they were engaged in spot fixing. Uh, some of the Indian cricketers in the IPL were spot fixing to so doing certain things within the course of the game. We've mentioned tennis and then in a more general sense, and we've got uh, Dergenko Snooker, as well as John Higgins, got people like Stephen Lee. Football, I said, I could have kept going for, for weeks and weeks running them there too. Um, the, the, the West German Austrian World Cup match back in 1982. Most of you are far too young to remember that, but 1982 there was a game played out in a particular way where the clear impression was that nobody actually cared. And it was partly to do with the, the lack of incentive for qualification because the game didn't matter, but there was also then subsequent allegations of a betting scandal around that particular game. And that's something that's worth thinking about too when we talk about the integrity of sport is what can sport do to make sure that every part of the sport actually has integrity. If you've got a dead rubber in a World Cup event, then actually you're more vulnerable because actually nothing, there's no consequences, no sporting consequences of who wins that. I can't remember the game which springs to mind, but I remember there was a, uh, I think it was a European Cup game, where the two teams, if there was a draw, they would both yep. go through, but if one team lost, another team won, then that team would obviously go out. So, with about 10 minutes to go, literally we kept on passing it along yep. the back line. Nobody would, you know, would challenge them. They almost both accepted it. 
um, and obviously that's a, that's an issue as well. Like, yeah, and this is a kind of related issue, and it, of course, it doesn't necessarily mean that there would be um, kind of match fixing. Well, there is match fixing, of course, but it's in a sense a different kind of match fixing. The match fixing here is the match fixing by the players and the association saying, actually, we're drawing to us just nicely here. We're not willing to take this as a proper event, and in some ways, it can be conspired or, or created by the governing body or the organizer, not creating a competition where you inevitably have to have some interest in each match. Um, so the match fixing can be for financial reasons, but it can be purely for sporting reasons. There's a reason why we want to play out a draw, because actually it's in our base based interest. And that's something that you know, we tend to focus in on, the, the financial pressures or rewards from match fixing, but actually you can get sporting um, drivers as well. Um, but I guess it goes way back, you know, um, yeah, the one at the top here, apparently 267 AD, um, the fathers of two teenage wrestlers, some major event, um, I struck a deal and said, okay, if you go down and you go down this particular way, uh, the donkey will be yours. You know, so highly simple, but that's an example of, of match fixing within that particular event. Somebody has altered the, the outcome of the event. Um, and down the bottom is another very famous one around the, the White Sox in the World, uh, the World Series Baseball League. Um, again, related, not, not dissimilar in some ways to the, to the Greek example around football. It was through non-payment, players not being paid properly, and then basically the players took the situation into their own hands and decided to alter the outcome of that. And that they then became known as the Black Sox for a period, or the case became known as the Black Sox, <coughs> as an indication of the, kind of the fact that they had not complied with the ethics and the integrity of the sport. Um, so that's quite a famous one. And then horse racing again, I spent, spent the rest of the, the week talking about examples of horse racing, where people are, are, um, are paid not to ride, people are paid not to win. Um, and again, that's, I imagine, I don't, I don't uh, ride a horse myself, but I would imagine that's something you could influence quite easily, um, whereby you just simply ride a little bit, and who's to say? How, how, how do you know? How do, at least one of the challenges, how do you know, how do you prove that some of this takes place? So lots and lots of examples. Um, uh, a match fixing, I'll just give you a, a kind of definition of this, it's more or less the things that we've covered, but this one comes from the Council of European Convention on the Manipulation of Sport Competitions. Who knew that such a thing existed? But there we go. It does exist and it has clearly a role to play in this particular event. So an intentional arrangement, act or omission, aimed at an improper alteration of the result or course of a sport competition, in order to remove all or part of the unpredictable nature of the aforementioned competition, with a view to obtaining an undue advantage for oneself or of, or, or should we say, for others. So, you know, that's just kind of putting it slightly more kind of legalistic language, but it's the kind of things that we've been talking about already. You want to sort something in a different way, either for financial gain or for some kind of sporting gain. And that's an attempt to kind of, of the European Convention, or part of the European Council. The important bit here maybe is not the definition, but it's the fact that that body exists. And that body exists because of what we said in the first slide, that this actually matters. That if we're seeing this as a threat to the integrity of sport, not just because we might enjoy sport, we like seeing fair competition, but because of the commercial value of sport and the risks to that commercial value if people stop believing in it. Believing in it. If you stop believing in it, I don't want you, you won't get media companies, you won't get sponsors, you won't get spectators. So there's a, a genuine sporting integrity aspect, and then there's the kind of result in all the um, the, uh, the derived implication for the business of sport, which we know is for better or for worse, is a very significant part of sport. You know, I think I think if one of the things are about, uh, and I think some of the examples probably hinted at this as well, is it's, it's <coughs> like you know, in stock markets, um, you can get what, what's called insider trading, um, and insider a stock market is supposed to be a free an open space where all information is known and we decide to transact on the basis of the publicly available information as to which stocks or shares that I choose to buy. However, if, if I'm interested in buying shares in a company and if I just happen to know people who work in that company and those people happen to pass information to me which isn't yet in the public domain and that allows me to take advantage of what I might expect to happen in share prices, that's what I mean by insider trading. So you know something about your company, it's not yet in public domain, you tell me, and I act on that before it comes into the public domain. So I get an advantage uh, over other people. You, you don't know this yet, so I sell my shares, uh, and you don't have the knowledge I've got, and you're left with the shares, and the share price collapses. I'm okay, because I walk away, because my friend over here has helped me. You're over there, left thinking, well, that's a bit of a shame, because now our investment portfolio has gone down. 
So instead of trading, it was of course illegal. So if uh, our relationship is found out, then uh, we're, both, we're both in trouble. But if it's not found out, I've just got a, a, a get out of jail card and you're left with a couple of losses. And insider trading, in a sense, is you can see how that would be, you can have parallels for that in sport too, whereby if you have got links into a particular sport or a particular sport organization or a particular athlete where there's an opportunity to influence and what to learn what's going on. It could be something as simple as injuries in a, in, a, in a particular team. So if those injuries are not known, then in a sense there's an opportunity to kind of benefit from that in some sort of insider trading way too. So there's kind of parallels with other areas, which is kind of why I put that point up there. Um, so back to my questions. Um, so we, we know what matters, we know uh, where it takes place, we now know in precise legalistic terms what it actually means, but it's our kind of common sense understanding. But what, why it takes place, I think we've covered this a bit already, but what's, what's, what's going on with match fixing? Why does it take place? Okay, yep. Lots of money for? Uh, the people who are sort of benefiting from a certain result. People who are betting on it. Yep. Okay, yes, yeah, so lots of money from the, so the, the, the syndicates or the corrupt groups that are, are setting these things up. They're, they're doing things, they want to make money, uh, first and foremost. Um, the individual athletes are often going to be um, incentivized by some kind of financial recompense, some kind of financial reward. And that could be in a situation of needs where you're not getting paid. Um, or, of course, it could be simply a situation of greed. But, you know, it's remarkable how many really, really high profile individuals have um, indulged or been found guilty of something to do with corruption. So, you know, there's no, I guess there's no, you can't have a kind of, you can't have an ethical scale around this, but it's certainly a much greater degree of sympathy for a great football player um, in a country where they've not been paid and they decide to do something slightly um, uh, lacking in virtue around the scoring competition than there might be for the captain of South Africa or the captain of the Indian cricket team um, who are probably reasonably well remunerated in the first place, who are obviously just fancy a little bit more, a little bit extra. So the idea of this simple thing behind it without oversimplifying it is, of course, it's about it's about um, financial gain. It can be about sporting reasons too, so it can be about match fixing, as we kind of just talked about the European Cup game or the World Cup game, where you've got a particular outcome which is desirable. It could also be more blatant than that, that you know, we agree that it's much better if you win the competition than if somebody else does it. So we all agree to stand back, because actually you've got the highest profile or you've got the best potential to generate uh, revenue for the sport in the future, so we stand back and let you win, because actually we're not as, we're not as um, attractive on TV or whatever it might be, those kind of things can happen as well. The things that you, I think you're, many of us that you are, are aware of this, of course, you know, is, is gambling. Um, so the stuff around gambling, of course, is inextricably linked to much of this. That much of the financial uh, rewards or opportunities come out of the fact that somebody somewhere um, is putting a punt on or putting a bet on something happening. So there's a reward to be made from the syndicates because of the close relationship between gambling and sport. And that's the, the something you know, which is you know, fundamental to sport at the present time, but we might well think is it's not a fundamental thing that we're actually very happy about because of its risks to, to integrity. So, again, something I know many of you mentioned, the whole online gambling thing makes this even more um, challenging to do because there's a kind of remoteness, there's a distance around it, uh, and the gambling syndicate could be based many millions of miles or hundreds of thousands of miles away from where the events are actually taking place. So that kind of simpler idea of events taking place in one place and then the market there and the gambling market surrounding that, you know, we know that doesn't exist anymore, that we'll have people betting on what happens in football matches um, at long distance from it. Let's say at weird five minutes. Okay, sorry, yeah, <laughs> that's, uh, that's good. So, okay, so, so those things I think you would be kind of familiar with. Um, yeah. Opportunity is one thing is about opportunities, so people take advantage of opportunities, you've got income inequalities, you've got reward for criminals. The duress thing you're chatting about, you know, the John Higgins example, where you know we shouldn't be naive about that. That's something that's happened. You, you can imagine the situation that sometimes some of these people are put in where you've got a very serious criminal gang who are saying, Yeah, no, you will lose the game. But if you don't lose the game, there'll be implications for your family or for your, your private life or whatever it might be. And that you might decide actually that's the lesser of two two evils here. Um, it's clearly not a condition in all of these things, but it is something that is there. 
individual scores may or may, or may not be easier to manipulate. I think you know, if you look at the number of football examples, you might end up thinking, well, that can't be true, because lots of football clubs and organisations seem to be involved in this. And it's not just we might have the referee example, it can be the players, but it can also be the owners. Uh, the Marseille example that I didn't talk about was came from the top down. The owner of Marseille Football Club, uh, Bernard Tapie, was the person who was central to the corruption and the match fixing. And if your boss then comes to you and says, you are going to lose the game, and that's the way you'll be suitably rewarded, and you're, you're, you're great football <coughs> players, but now I want to lose this game or to do whatever it might be, then again, there's a kind of dependency relationship that sitting here would say, well, I wouldn't do that because um, I've been told to lose a football match, but that's your employer, that's your life, you, know, you can see where some of the pressures come from. Um, as our uh, last question I think I had was, um, uh, what's the response to match fixing? So there we are, throw that wall. What, what has happened or what should happen to match fixing? So how, I mean, that's a bit of a mess there, if you'll be honest about it. It's another mess. Paul gave you a bit of a mess. Here's another huge mess in sport, thing that we all passionately care about, yet that we're barely scratching the surface of the mess that this is. So what, if anything, can we do about this? Increase like the punishment for the people who are like or like organizer and involved in it. It's quite pretty off. <coughs> okay, yeah, so you can take that kind of uh, that kind of the, the legal approach and say, well yeah, there are punishments, a bit like probably the stupid thing, I'm gonna punish you more. If I find out you're being match fixing, the punishment's even greater. Okay, that's certainly one uh, fairly kind of natural response to that, you get punishments. Anything else? Maybe same as you mentioned the uh Getting the sensitive data in one of the companies, uh, which can provide the uh, like uh, on the stock markets, right? If you share that with your colleague, and you will get uh, uh, benefit, financial benefit. Yep. So all those companies are super protected by law, yep. uh, by any disclosures, and maybe that could be transferred to the sports. Okay, yes, so a, a greater focus on kind of the, the disclosure aspects and, and in a sense almost the monitoring and control of the organisations that, that exist within sport who are clearly fundamental to the, the integrity of the sport competitions. You've got an aspect of punishment perhaps, you've got an aspect of disclosure and monitoring control. Anything else? Could you not reduce the type of bets that are allowed to take place? So in terms of football, being able to bet on the minute a corner is conceded or something like that, there would not be a way you could regulate how the gambling companies would do that, and that would reduce the, sort of, the chances that you could get spot fixing, that type of thing, take place? Yep, absolutely. I think you could, you could imagine certainly a scenario where um, you, you alter the regulatory framework in which gambling exists. But just again, think of the practicalities of that. In, a, in the online gambling world that we exist in now. So the UK comes along, so this is an example, as we're sitting here in the UK, says, we're not happy with this, we're going to stop all this online gambling, we're going to stop all the, yes, we're going to stop all the, the spot fixing or spot, spot markets that exist. But I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about working at when the next thrower will come, and I just go online and I find another gambling company that is based in Singapore or it's based in Germany, or, and I, I can't do anything, you can't do anything about that. I think it's really good, but you can see how this becomes Really complicated. And um, other thoughts? Maybe give the <clears throat> people involved uh, security that if they come forward, they're going to be like those things are going to be dealt with. Because last season, um, <laughs> uh, like the other team, like in football, um, somebody came to the goalkeeper of my team and they told him that they were paying for letting him score two goals. Um, and the goalkeeper came uh, forward and told um, like the officials of his club um, that this this is what happened, and so uh, they dealt with it. Yeah. So I think um, even if if it's like the thing that you said, where you got kind of personal implications, uh, where they tell you uh, if you don't do this, something's going to happen to you. I think that the security of for referees and athletes that um, these things can be regulated and can be monitored. Sure, yep. yeah, I think whistle whistleblowing aspects and the protection of whistleblowers like that would be a really a good thing too. I mean, I think, in a sense, and we're now gonna have a run out of time, of course, but um, there, is, there is a ton of stuff that is going on 
but there's a ton of stuff that's going on that's still scratching the surface. And some of the examples that guys you've given here are, are, are really good examples of things that are either going on but could be developed a little bit further. So you do get kind of monitoring systems, the uh, FIFA are interested in monitoring system, the IOC are going to go, oh, they're just looking all the time, they're trying to be alert to what's going on so that if you do see something, they're much faster to react to those kind of legal betting patterns that might go on. In tennis, they've got kind of integrity, ten, integrity, ten, tennis integrity unit, similar ones in other sports where, again, it's that kind of almost continual observation of what's going on. You've got governments getting involved. I mentioned our friends at the Council of Europe, um, so they, they have recognised there's a kind of governmental response, so it is trying to deal with that problem of how you go beyond one country. Um, and you've also got private sector companies coming in too who offer to kind of provide services to governing bodies and others about uh, monitoring, prevention, uh, and, and so on, education, which I guess you didn't mention, but I know a number of you did mention that in your, your own reports. Education is perhaps one of the best things, a bit similar to the doping example too. And then of course the, the, the elephant in the room remains, I know we talked a wee bit about it there, but is the problem remains, as long as there's gambling there in some form rather than say the sort of sport, we're going to have problems. There's going to be problems forever and for a day, as long as this is inextricably linked with gambling, as uh, so with sport. Um, but that's a tough one to crack. Anyway, I, I should stop because I know we've got some of you got a meeting to go to, and I've talked a lot enough anyway. So it's very nice to meet you all, and I'm sure we'll see you, see you all uh, in due course next semester. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. This was the last speaker and the last hour of Principles of Management and Sport for this semester. So, um, from my personal point of view, I would like to thank you all for your participation throughout the in weeks and I wish you a very pleasant time for your Christmas uh, and I hope to see you again next year and that's it for me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.